So, ladies and gentlemen, we have Dr. J if, Ooh, if hang on a second. I just raised my chair. I now shot my head out of the wow. camera. Wow. No, yeah. it's all okay. good. You're making okay, me good. look small. You are look, a big guy. Uh, that was, I was meant to, to happen. Get a yeah. eyeball with you. Yeah, okay. We needed that. Yeah, okay. Honestly, if when we put together, like, who's our dream guest, we're only, you know, 20 episodes in. You're my number one. Oh, thank you. You really well, are. Congratulations. You've done it. I know. We've arrived. We've, uh, this is it. Together, we're, what are you doing? Arrived. You reached You're in my top 10. Whatever. And because, and and I'm just so happy we met here and not on Celebrity Rehab. That would not have been good because no. I yeah I used to be on TV and I was a big drug addict yeah. so uh, I'm very happy that this is how we're meeting. Good. I just want congratulations to say. and we have uh, a debate we need you to settle right away right, on the it. show. First thing, well let's introduce him properly. Oh, hold on, okay. this is more important. Okay, Are does people... he need an introduction? Well, Who I wanted, doesn't I've know always Dr. wanted to Drew say is. Uh, <laughs> board certified physician and addiction medicine specialist. Done and done. Uh, Dr. Happened. Drew Pinsky, host of uh, many podcasts, including the Dr. Drew podcast, the Adam and Drew podcast, This Life, or- uh, no, We're not doing that right now, but okay. the, that streaming thing that we do on Sundays. Yeah, and what's the name it's of that? Ask Dr. Drew. We'll, ask, ask sign Dr. up at drdrew.tv, we'll give you a blast when we go on stream. Then and, you can, and you can interact, real-time real calls. Yes, and you have an AM radio show. I got, got canceled. Okay, I so- Wow. Look, I went to See, Dr. you're my number one, I knew that. It's all awesome. good. Awesome. Kareem. I went to drdrew.com and just looked at oh, all the yeah. stuff that you, you This is why you and don't do research. And Dr. Drew After Dark. He did a, yes, that's always fun. Dr. After Dark. Yes, which has that's been very that. fun, it's actually. It's been very fun, yes. A couple of interesting ones coming. I love it. I'm a huge uh, right. Your Mom's House fan, that whole thing. I've, I'm, They're the best, right? I love it. It's, yeah. it's really... But I feel like all your training, you could finally answer this question we have. Are people who have gender reveal parties assholes? <laughs> I say yes, big time. And you're yeah. my number one guy, so just... Okay, so it was not part of my experience when I had kids. Thank and I, you. And I would argue I didn't miss anything. Thank and you. had my wife demanded we do something like that, I would have been embarrassed divorced. and ashamed. Not divorced. divorced. Really? No, divorced. I would have been sort of weirded out. You had triplets, yes. correct? Yes, yes. Wow. Okay, so how, yeah, imagine the mess that would have made. Right? At the how many cakes with Too the much. goddamn Too whatever much. inside? See, you didn't think you can go higher from the peak, but saying that, we're, we're, you're, we're you're, you're okay. higher okay. in my book than you were I, I just I'm I'm ecstatic. You're speechless. Mm -hmm. I'm, just not, I'm not a huge water. fan of those those parties. I, I'm generally not a kind of a ritual guy, a party guy. I don't, I don't mm -hmm. like events and things. It's fifty fifty. It's a boy or a girl. Yeah. It's fu oh, don't get me started. Well, now we I'm we just... had we had a gender reveal at the ultrasound, right? Sure. And and they actually even played a trick on me. They were like, they my wife had already seen it and she didn't tell me, and she goes do the boys first and he'll freak out that we have three boys. And then they're like, well, we can't really see this third one. I don't know. Maybe it's three boys. And it was a girl. Oh. So she played that game on me. So nice. three, you have three kids total? Three triplets. Or more? Triplets. No, that's it. Wow. That's it. You must not have kids. You would know of the triplets. If you survive, <laughs> I don't. You're not going to do Very good. That. Damn, he's good. <laughs> so, you're not so going again. I think something that me and Jamie struggle with, I don't know if Kasim really does, but something I think you're amazing at is how do you... How are you such a good listener? Like, do you practice mm. it? Cause us like trying to be in the moment is something mm -hmm. we always talk about. And I feel like you're so good at that, especially bouncing around from yeah. all the shit you do. And thank you for uh, understanding that. Cause uh, the average person does not. So yeah. that already means you have a deeper appreciation for what that is, which sets you up to be somebody that can do that. Right. Wow. And, and uh, you're recovering, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you've been the object of that kind of scrutiny. Right. You know what it is to have somebody really pay attention to you. You will. I don't know if you are doing it already or one day you'll be doing that for other people as a sponsee, as a sponsor for your sponsees. And really all you're doing, you know, when you're listening to a fourth and fifth step is you are just tuning to that person. Right. And so I, I call it listening with your whole body that you first have to listen to the ears, right? You better be you better be hearing what's going on, but you have to use your whole body as an antenna. And whatever you experience, whatever feelings, what, whatever music smells, whatever comes into your consciousness as you're listening with your ear intently, that's deeply meaningful. And so you have to kind of, I've learned, I, and by, by the way, myself an object of, as a patient, I was in therapy for over a decade and with a great emotionally focused therapist who, attuned to me for 10 years and uh, it built my machinery to be able to do that for other people. Mm. Wow. Is that yeah. why people like set the mood for certain things? Like whether it even just be like sex or anything with music and tone because it allows you to focus better because it, it ignites certain it, types yes of- Yes and no. Uh, it, 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 it's again, what we're talking about is communion with another human right mm -hmm. closeness and and you know sex and romance and those things you actually don't want to be doing this kind of community it's it's too 
one <laughs> romance all of our other shit gets involved everything else is poured into it and it's supposed to be right that's yeah. sort of how romance works and if you want to set the mood for receptivity which i think is what you're talking about uh yeah sure you can be more receptive by setting the mood in the room but this kind of presence is a different thing where you're it's like i'm putting myself here right now with the totality of my being on behalf of that person and mm. that's all i'm doing and how many, and i expect no reciprocity from it i'm mm. just present for that person it's and how often do you have to do that like consciously for patience I mean, right. how much I have in to your daily that. life, it, it it depends on what I'm doing. Yeah, I don't. In my in my daily life, I try not to do it, right? Because it's a kind of a mechanism. And, I, and occasionally, I'll be in real like like I'm probably not going to do it much here. But but when occasionally something will wash over me, I go, oh, oh, oh I'm kind of listening to something. I don't mm -hmm. know where that came from. Somebody Thank like you. I was giving a lecture once, and and all of a sudden I got really emotional. Uh, and I thought that came from somewhere. That's not, I, I was talking about, I was talking about closeness. I was talking about community and stuff. And I, and I immediately got washed over with this deep feeling that I was like, that wasn't mine. And I looked in the front row and I go, is that, are you somebody, is somebody not okay here? This woman went, I, I am. And afterwards she talked to me and there was all, wow. kinds, just all kinds of stuff going on. Wow. Huh. So, so you're some people empath. call that psychic. Yeah. Right? Empathy, you are a full empathy, empathy, empathy. Yeah. Yeah. I, okay. Look, so let me just take a, a two minutes to just, suck you off for a second because I generally just happened no, no, I, okay. yeah. not, not all of you no this guy can so really much. I'm gonna <laughs> so, I'm a and by the way I just want to say <laughs> I just want to say I'm not in any program so I don't want to like I don't so want just, it to seem like I well, said yes I was okay, so, and then so I'm you're not just, you're just abstinent yeah yeah I just uh, yeah I stopped drinking seven years ago cool. I so blah, blah. so what you're missing uh, is the opportunity to be in a close relation with somebody that really attunes to you and listens to you and whatever shame and guilt I don't know if you're in therapy right now I mean, it's the same thing yeah since i moved out here i'm same not thing. you're not but same no. same idea you know yeah, what that yeah. is the same it's the same thing with a person who shares deeply your experience and mm -hmm. can say to you i i get it i know what that is i have addiction too and i'm recovering and i get it yeah i went yeah. to an addiction specialist in new york when i had to kick benzos and uh, yeah <laughs> so uh so yeah I, I i experienced it but i just never uh you didn't worked, touch the program work yeah. the program you yeah. don't have to do you think because he's not in the program why he has no interest in being in a romantic relationship. I haven't like dated in, in two years. What do you think? Well, at first, so what happened was I felt like my, sorry, Cass, I don't want to. No, 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 I'm ready to go. Don't worry. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> this is good. This uh, is important. I won't forget about what's this. Wrong with yeah. No, I'm trying Cass. to figure out what's wrong with Rob. <laughs> so, if you could talk slow. <laughs> <laughs> right, it so it's going to take a while. So, um, are, are you afraid? Well, let me just, let me throw the cards on the table. The, relationships take people out all the time are you fearful that it's gonna no no no, okay. no I, I don't um i'm not worried about my sobriety at yeah. all okay cool. ever especially with like drinking and uh, like you know there's some days where i'm like man it'd be nice to take a percocet and watch fucking youtube for toy but of course no i i drinking i'm just so because i'm so healthy now that i'm like man putting that shit in my you don't butt, lose that. Yeah. yeah whatever and when my when i do fantasize if i ever do which is very rare about doing anything it's like i want to do it for one day and i know i can and i'm not that person so it's like I I would never if okay. if I even think of like I'm never like right, man right. I would love to be hooked on Percocets again. So what about know? the relationship? What's the problem? Uh, so I felt like I had an unhealthy relationship with uh, sex, where like it was more like I wanted to have sex with a girl, and then when I did, I felt like it was I reached what I had to do, and it was so. That's it. I decided to take uh, three months off and not do any really work and go. And then when I went and had sex again, I was like, nothing has really changed, you mm -hmm. know? And after funny sex, how I, that works. yeah. And it was funny, like how, like after sex, I was just, I was always very like, I would have sex and I'd be like, okay, I want to be alone now. You yeah. know, I don't want you around anymore. And I think after doing, so I decided to take a year off and have no sex. And I did a, a, a lot of work and kind of uh, work? well, just a lot of uh, reading, a lot of meditating a lot and like figuring out that, the reason was because I wasn't interested in getting to know those girls to then have sex with them to get closer to them. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to have sex because I was trained in that way of like, you want to come, you want to bust a nut, you want to do. So So I decided to take a year off and I didn't have any sex or date anything for a year, which was very pretty easy after the first couple of months because I was living in Vegas and mm -hmm. I don't really know a lot of girls there. And uh, once the year ended, I got to this point where I was like, well, now I don't want to just break it for, for you know like there's girls who have hit me up or who are like oh i'm out you know it's a, and i'm like well i don't want to just have sex with you i want to find someone where i could i don't think there's i think in today's age it's there's so much like just fucking and this and i think it's 
something great for me to be able to tell a girl like I haven't had sex in two years and getting to know you has made me want to have sex with you. It's all good. But you then have to kind of put yourself out there a little bit to find that person. Yeah, for sure. And like I. And I'm going to guess that's kind of scary to you. No, it's not so much scary as it is like I hate being a, like I don't want to do the fucking dating apps and whatever. So like I'm kind of like I'm just letting it happen. And I've met girls and I've had conversations with them. But I think the problem is like. It's almost like I'm taking it too serious, right? Because I'm looking for, it's like, oh, if you're not my, my wife, I, sh I should just stop talking to you right, right now. Right. You know? You also have admitted that you don't want to like, He, I think he's spent so much time alone and yeah. taking care of himself in the way that he, he has so much pride as he should, the way he's changed his life around. I'm so proud of him every day and he's so health conscious that like, you also don't want anyone inter you've said you don't want anyone interfering with like your rhythm and your routine. Well, it's more so because I've I've gone out on dates with girls who say I don't drink and then an hour into the date they're drunk and they're like smoke hey, let's go I want to go outside and smoke a cigarette and, and I'm just like man I'd rather be home alone or with For my sure. friends or the, and it's so frustrating that like uh, you know, it's just something where I'm like, man, I could go without it. Like, I'm so I, I feel like if people weren't telling me you have to date, you have to date. <laughs> I'm so happy. Yeah. And I'm in such a good place yeah. that like I, you know, it's I definitely feel like something is missing. But I also feel like I've known I've been in those relationships where I'm like, man, it's it's a lot of work, you know, can't argue with your success. Right. That, that's the, the proof is in the pudding. You're doing well. You're doing better. You like it. Good. The concerns I have are that going from hypersexual to nothing is flip side of the same coin. Yeah, so well, it wasn't so much hypersexual. It was just more when I did, there was no, I wasn't trying to connect with that person yeah, and using it as that, but it wasn't like I was like trying to fuck every night or- So it wasn't a big thing to you. Okay. No, no, it was when I was really young and then I, I got- say, in, you had a point where it was. When I was young and then I got an STD and it, which was one of the things that like, luckily I, I, I thought I was going to die, but I just got like a shot in the ass and it went away <laughs> three yeah. days later. And sure. like, but th that week before and waiting for the tests and everything, your heart's fucking pounding. And after that, I kind of became like a germaphobe and like, uh, <laughs> you know, I think that's also when like the isolation became a lot easier when I could just sit on my couch for two weeks taking The, the only thing I would say, the only thing is that there, there's probably still some intimacy, something going on where yeah. we're connecting in a truly intimate way is something well, i, don't I know can what. tell you why for uh, sure okay yeah so uh, it may be time to get back into therapy and what, what did a female or male therapist back at home i had uh i saw a female that didn't we, you uh, might want to get a female times. therapist and form a tight attachment to that person mm. that's healthy and secure and then you can translate that out onto the world that can be that can be a goal of therapy right is tolerating closeness with another human in a therapeutic context allows you to then go do that outside particularly yeah. and, female well, it's, I just have a feeling that would work. Yeah, because yeah. I've had I've had like a female it doesn't yoga. Have to be, doesn't like it? I've had a female yoga teacher before, yeah. and I know exactly what you're talking. Okay, like that that's another way to do that, right? Yeah, that yeah. You could do, I would. I'd be. If I don't know the problem with that is I don't know what that particular person is trained to do, and they may be over their head. But for those they, of us that have that, mommy issues, it's good for us to develop a healthy good. relationship yeah, with yeah. a female. But but the one point I want to make is. We don't change that much in our emotional landscape by ourselves. You can change your life a lot, as you found, and stopping drugs and things massively changes everything, right? Yeah. But in terms of changing the landscape of our emotional life, that happens interpersonally. Hmm. That happens with another human being. Yeah. Well, that's what I've done. Yeah. I've opened up my life to a lot of relationships. No, no. I mean, so I mean a professional. Oh, okay. I mean, somebody who can, can understands that and can and can work with that wiring and get it to a you know this healthy place. Right. Okay. That's yeah. A, no, I, I and have you don't to have to. I'm not saying, oh, so God, you got to do that. I'm just saying that I think that would fix that piece you're looking for pretty quickly. Yeah. So I think just so you know, I, I really want to like, because I wrote down a couple of things where I'm like, you should know this. So I think a thing that like really fucked me up when I was younger was uh, the only girl that I ever loved, I found out slept with uh somebody who's like a brother to me it's like horrible. my best friend and it's in beyond. in an instant i just completely lost both of them you know like it was gone beyond. and it also i was like 18 ish mm -hmm. and it's just like it was it was the first it might be the only time in my life besides someone dying that i really felt heartbreak i'm sure and yeah no wonder you didn't want to be close to any other women yeah. No wonder. Right. And it, we weren't together at the time. We had broken it, up, but she, you know, whatever. she knew. It had she, the impact. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. I'm betting that there's some antecedent something that set all that up. There's, uh, there's something deeper that set that up. I don't know why. To them. For you. You're saying. It's mommy so, stuff. It's something. I don't know. That's it's, it's mommy, for the reason that I was so upset, you're saying? 
the reason you invested so much in those two people that you shouldn't have trusted, the reason something, there's something that set that up that was before. Well, if we're not fulfilled at home with our families and we're looking for that it's, attention and love elsewhere, we put we overvalue friendships to the point where we, we'll create sure. heartbreak and and resent it. And we years reenact later. things, we reenact stuff. Yeah. And we don't know we're reenacting stuff, and you don't even see it till way you have to get way outside of yeah. it to see the reenactments and stuff. But I'm just going to tell you, there's more to be sort of unraveled there that that'll have deeper meaning to you somehow. Uh, right. And so and, we we're going to yeah. diagnose them as crazy. <laughs> uh, I'm looking for a diagnosis for Rob. Uh, keep going. Sex Let's keep craze. talking. So, yeah, so just just so you know, a couple of things that I wrote down. That I'm yeah. like, you should, so I started smoking and drinking when I was 12. Ooh. So what the, what was going on? Uh, you know, like I don't know if you know, we were on Sopranos yeah. TV show, or whatever, yeah. and that was kind of like kicking off and starting and it just became like you got a lot of attention and some people said hey you want to come you know i lived right next to the projects and they're like you want to come up and smoke and drink and hang out and we i went upstairs and i smoked because and I they drank. seen you on tv uh yeah well, it I, was actually, HBO. I actually think no this was not tv yeah this was actually before that but <laughs> it just keep these guys down yeah. I, <laughs> I i grew up in a neighborhood and around people who were you know it was there was a lot of weed it, there was a lot it. of alcohol but what was going on with your parents uh, my dad, my, my mom, uh, raised me and it was just kind of, uh, like, you know, all my uncles were always smoking weed and drinking was and mom this a night. stage mom. This was a big, no, problem. not at all. Okay. Not and at all. Dad were, were, were but very young, right? When she had you. very young. Yeah. How yeah. old was she? Uh, she was 18, 17. And we're, like what's 18. up with dad? Dad, uh, was just like doing his own thing. Like went off, got married that he saw me on like weekends. Some, most of the time. Alcoholic okay. addict. Uh, maybe I don't want to, you know, yeah, talk you about his shit, but he's, uh, he's yeah. now we get along and, and everything's great. It's yeah. all good. But then it's just, it just yeah. with the impact it has on a little kid is profound. Yeah. Yeah. And then from, from 16 years old to 31, like I never spent 24 hours sober Whew. ever. I'm glad you're here. If it was like, yeah, like I would, you know, it was night, night. If, if it was like, cause when I worked on Sopranos, I never fucked around. And I, but then as soon as we fucking wrapped, like I would make a bowl out of tinfoil and f had weed on me and then drinking and this, but the, so something I actually wanted to talk to you about and, and figure out if it was, what do you think about this is, so at, uh, uh Sopranos ended for me when I was like 22 mm. and at 23, I had my first anxiety attack mm. and that's when I started benzos and, uh -huh. and, and that was, uh, and I either took benzos or drank every day for eight years. Unfortunately, heavy cannabis can trigger the panic. I understand you were also losing stuff and you you had a big transition, but yeah, <laughs> it's, you know, I can't tell you how many times I have people, I see people with overwhelming panic from heavy cannabis. So what what I wanted to figure out is like, because right at the end of Sopranos is when I had my first anxiety attack. And also- And by the way, they normally start 18 to 22. It's just when they start. Right. Mm -hmm. And then right at the, the last, so Jamie has MS and the last scene of Sopranos was the last time she said she was ever able to run. Mm. After that, she, she couldn't anymore. And I just mm. like, uh, those things for me- It's a lot kind of like sure. where it was like wow Sopranos and like during big change in your life and loss and stuff like oh, that yeah. that's when things I, really I had panic when I was 19 horrible disabling it's awful and I wondered I and I was smoking a little pot around that time too and I wondered if that helped trigger it because I've mm -hmm. seen so many patients with that it, and it scares me now to smoke pot I'd love to try all this great stuff that's around yeah. but it yeah. scares me I'm gonna trigger panic again yeah <laughs> but yeah yeah and panic is horrible right so were you were you an addict no, no, no. You I'm were not just, an addict. I just, I, I have depression, panic, general anxiety, all that good stuff. Yeah. Because I had never felt anxiety in my entire life. And when people used to say it, I yeah. was of that like, oh, you're just being a fucking put that. And then when you felt it for the first time and my friend said, oh, you could just take a Xanax. And then that there was for the, nobody so, ever. panic disorder. Yeah. Got a, got a diagnosis for you. Panic okay. disorder. Yep. Uh, right. That panic disorder. Benzodiazepine addiction. Got that. Yeah. And then that was. Alcoholism. Got that. Every yeah. day for. Uh, or alcohol use disorder, we call for it. For eight years, I was yeah. taking benzos. Horrible. And then. Uh, Who gave you that? Kill that guy. Uh, well, yeah. Yeah, I mean, let's murder you know, him. Yeah. Not, so, it, well, it, so it's not mad. a doctor. Oh. It was not a doctor. Okay. Yeah. Well, still. <laughs> yeah. I was I, never really getting my my stuff from doctors until the end when I went to see a specialist and he. Took you off. Said, if you stop getting off of that, we'll do this program. This and. That guy needs an award. Yeah. <laughs> did you guys have Loveline in New York? Because wh when did Loveline sure. go national? Yeah. Uh, in the mid to late 90s. It was Z100. Okay. So, yeah. It was Z100, but course. it was midnight to three on Z100. Catherine's a friend of mine. 
Catherine McCord? Yeah. Oh, no kidding. Mm-hmm. Please say hi for me. I will. Oh, my God. That's crazy. Yeah. I just saw Diane Farr, who was the one before Oh, I remember her. when yeah. she uh, uh, guest, or I don't know, she was like the host for a Diane. while. Diane. Yeah. Diane, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then she guest yeah. hosted. She's now, she and Adam are buddies now after all these years. It's very weird. That's cool. Yeah. So, look, I went to school out here in Southern California, Newbury Park, and- um, At Rib Bay? Newbury Park. Newbury Park. Uh, in the city of Newbury Park. Oaks. Got it, yeah, got yeah. It, got it. <clears throat> and we would listen to the show every night um, at 10, almost every night, because it was really the only, it was the only way we could get like real information. Yeah, mm-hmm. I know. That's, and, why, that's uh, why I started it. I, I look, thought, what would I have wanted? Okay, so this is where I got to suck you down. Okay. This is <laughs> that show, what that show did for me. And then up until, because uh, I am in recovery and and- Every time I was getting close to, um, I, when I was I was hitting what I thought was going to be a rock bottom, I had your voice echo in my head, right? The signs of being an alcoholic. I remember you specifically saying things like uh, drinking in the face of consequences, momentum. Yeah. Um, and, I, you know, I know. Denial. Uh, all that <laughs> stuff. And then, in, you know, 12 Step has its own yeah. definition, but yeah, all yeah. those things lined up. But your voice specifically because it was the only one i didn't have my parents there mm. well i mean they were there but they weren't there right. to tell me what was you know maybe i was you know, struggling with a thing that i could get help for yeah, yeah i didn't have everyone that i you know was friends with was also drinking the same amount but you know they could stop when they wanted to stop a lot of them did you know some of them still i think struggle with that yeah. but um that show specifically made such a big impact. And I know you get this all the time, but this is my this is my opportunity to just say thank you. you because, it. you know, I, and I entered a, a, a program and I got a sponsor and I sponsor cool. guys. And, so and awesome. um, it's been, you know, I have three years coming up and, it, and it's, it's a, big a, deal. a lot of it is, is just identifying initially that, you know, I was hopeless and and powerless and and um what what was your bottom how'd you decide to change it was after a breakup mm. and uh you know it, it i felt so bad and so then i started i started getting panic kill, attacks do you want to kill yourself no i don't think it was that bad but it was to the point where like I all this panic you have panic too <laughs> so i don't, I don't want to leave you out panic. heavy <laughs> cannabis <laughs> use <laughs> well, can you? Get to me i had you? heavy heavy so, cannabis yeah, use I, that's i tell you it's a very common yeah. thing with and i had my first panic attack felt like i was having a heart attack yeah, or something awful. i couldn't panic breathe it was worst. just it's terrible it's the fucking worst yeah. a lot of those little things add up and then after a while you just say oh i this isn't something i can do on my own you know and um everything's you know has been everything lately has been just okay it's like you know life life was very tough but I didn't realize how tough it was for me because on the outside there was a lot of perceived success and and um, I had a YouTube channel that was like doing really well and and I had a I co-founded a company that sold and it was all this perceived success but all that did was exacerbate and make you know all those it, things it, it stands out against how you're feeling yeah so and and then shame is usually what's under there it's like oh I'm yeah so there was a lot shame. of that yeah there was a lot of that yeah, so um awful. yeah I mean what and, so you guys are a happy group so yeah. this is, this is so, <laughs> I actually, Jamie brings so. us up but me and Rob would you know we could really bring it down if we want. <laughs> see but I feel like in the last couple of years like every time you see me you're like man you're so happy to come do the podcast or when we hang yeah. out you're so happy to hang out and I'm like no I'm just I'm just a fucking happy you're just you're just fine yeah I'm just like I and, and listen I think the most important thing is for me it's like I don't have a nine to five yeah. if I had a nine to five I think I'd be fucking lost you don't like that but yeah. I I just having all that time all the, to be able to go to the gym, eat right, f- meditate. For, like I've meditated every day for like a thousand days, you know, all this shit where it's like, that's what, I don't know how people who have a nine to five and they wake up three hours before their job to go to the gym. I'm like, wow. Like you can't that's, do that. that's right. a fucking, you know that well, I don't, I don't think I can, but I just, I see that and I'm like, that's a fucking superhero to me. Mm. Then you could probably do it. You could probably yeah. do it. You just wouldn't, you wouldn't like it. I just like yeah. waking up early and, and going to the gym and that, like, I'm like, wow, I, it's. I bet you could do it. I don't think you'd like it that much, but you could probably do it. Right. And that's the thing right now. Like I, I, I do, I just, I love being healthy. I love, mm-hmm. and I love figuring it all out and unlocking all these th- yeah. things. And and it's just, Good. yeah, it's just, and I think, I think a big thing was the way that I grew up, uh, we were just taught and told like, all those people who are really happy, they're just being fake. Really? Yeah. Well, it wasn't like they sat down and like gave us a lesson on that, but that was the thing. Like, it was like, wow, that person's so nice. And they're like, yeah, she's a fucking bitch. Like Uh, that kind of thing. And everybody in my, in, in the house was very 
just unhappy and yeah, we're yeah. just here to we're, you know you do this and you have to work this job until you die and then you you Dude. hope to yeah. So like I always had that thing, and then I surrounded myself with friends who were kind of like that. When I would be around super positive that, people, that's the part I'm telling you. There's something there with that the two that violated you. Yeah, you surrounded yourself with people like that. Well, well, the the girl thing. It was just I was 17 years old and struck by this girl was so beautiful I, 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 and I, I, I get l- it. lost I get my virginity it. to her. It was like you know that whole fucking I get thing. It. I get yeah, it. I get it. But yeah. still, I'm there's it's uncanny how we select these things in our lives. Yeah, yeah for yeah. sure. Does his lack of a spiritual and I'm I'm going to talk about you like you're not here. Do you have worries worry about him? It's very tough for me to. Because he's doing okay. He's you, doing you can't fine. Can't be critical of what and, and you don't, and it's not you know it's not your the game is not about telling people how to do totally. it. Totally. Yeah. Um. I I don't feel like there's some people who I know that um are sober but they they smoke pot and it's in that gray area. That, and that, it's that like, goes bad. Trust me. I've, I, I I have the longer view of that. That goes I, bad. I know so, I couldn't do it. Yeah, you know, once yeah. once I start the the train moving, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just a matter of time before yeah. I'm I'm on it. Um, you know, I I. He's been great, yeah. you know, but th- there are there's just little things that I think that could improve his life as uh, expanding it spiritually. And, and that's, I, that's the part I think he, he's missing a little bit. And, you know, I but everyone's got to figure that out on their own. Right. Like, correct. you know, absolutely right. it's so, so hard. Go. It's so hard to, to and, you can plant a seed, but yeah, the, yeah, all yeah. you can do is hope it grows, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, some of the stuff that you've been doing lately, I've been very, I've been impressed with your entire goddamn career. It's, mm. it, I feel like you've just been around, you've been around forever. It's ridiculous. Um, <laughs> but you the, look so good. God bless you. Oh, we were just talking about how jacked you are. And yeah. He, he was like, oh, he's got to be taking testosterone. No, I wish. Nothing. I I, he I eats meat and, and lifts heavy weights. I, I don't lift heavy weights anymore. I just, oh. I just got cut off on that. And so, I'm just so how, do you, how are you My jacked? shoulder, I'm only a couple weeks off the heavy weights, oh. <laughs> but I live pretty heavy. Anyway, it's not like I used to. Do you and, seven uh, days a week in the gym when you're healthy? Uh, I just have a garage. I do, it's part of my morning routine. I just go in there for 25 minutes and that's it. Yeah. Maybe wow. 40 if I'm lucky. Um, I would love to take testosterone. I know I would feel better if I did, yeah. but because I have prostate cancer, I can't. Wow. I, oh, I can't. you can't. I cannot. It will, it will grow my cancer. Wow. And, I'm in the uh, middle of trying to figure out why I have slightly low testosterone because I listened to an episode of, that you did where somebody called in and they're like, they had the tumor on the uh, pituitary. Prolactinoma, yeah. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I hope I, I have that <laughs> because it seems like the post, you know, once they figure yeah. that out, there's a huge sort of Yo, benefit. Oh, my God. Did you read um, uh, Ken Baker's book called Man Made? He had a I have not read that. And but, he talks about the testosterone yeah, yeah. storm that happens after you get oh, the Oh, yeah. Because my, yeah. my sex drive was low, but, you know, I'm, I'm doing little things to work on it here and there. Okay. Um, I gave him some ashwagandha, some maca. Good, good. I try to, you it's know. It's all good. Yeah. Lift weights. I came yeah, in horny today. I do. I do. And, 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 and that's the other part is that I, I just used to box, uh, mm. train boxing. And then I remember you talking about with Catherine Wood about lifting heavy weights and, mm-hmm. and all this and how that, you know, improves that testosterone. So I yeah. started doing that. Good. When I met him, he was a mess. tell, but. When I met him, he was a mess. Then he met me and I said, listen, here's, yeah, yeah. here's what you got to do now. <laughs> good, yeah. good, good. Here's, here's what, here's and, what and you And has it improved? Uh, yeah. I, I came in horny, just horny today, just as I a. No, I didn't want to hear I didn't want to hear about that. I see I you and I'm just. Neither did Jamie, but she had no flesh. is flesh to me right now. How about the level of testosterone? How'd that do? Um, I, I have to go in and for another okay, test. I so, and it requires. By the me way, to the fast. reason my coat is off, it's like it's hot. In Ninety three degrees in oh. here. Really? Can we? <laughs> let's do something about it. Little Let me air? open a door it's a little. little what do you want to do? Okay, so you've been doing. Um, you just went to the White House to talk about mental health. Um, I want to talk to you about that. I, you've been um, one of the few voices speaking up about homelessness in our town because mm. it's yeah, it something that crazy. is like we me. all are affected by it doesn't matter where you live now i live in culver city yeah and um it, you know and my girlfriend lives in venice and i i can't drive to her house without seeing yeah. like just unbelievable amounts of it it's terrible and yeah. and you have a solution and i and i've and I've, t- I've heard you on podcast talk about you know people want you to run for local office and and run for adam schiff's position and like i don't know if i can vote in that Local, but I would. I mean, I would throw all my support behind you because there's. I appreciate there it. There is and, and so much that needs to be done. So they, don't you feel like everyone? The leaders are asleep at the wheel in this town. Yes. Just Absolutely, just asleep at the wheel. Yeah, and that's what I, I started looking around. Like I, I, I felt morally like I, I got to do something. I'm yeah, just, I'm moved. I'm just yeah. every day. I'm like I've got to do something. This can't go on. Three dead in our streets every fucking day. That's crazy. I, I, we wow. got to do something. And so I was talking on Adam Carolla's podcast, and I was like, I just realized I lived in Schiff's district. I didn't even know that. Yeah, and I thought maybe I should run for that office, and that became he's running. 
Let me be clear. I'm not running. I'm not running for Schiff's seat. I'm not. We, we not need, right now, anyway. We need it. I don't know. Maybe maybe a couple of years. How I've many hours a, of sleep do you get a night? I, I used to be five or six, max. And now? Now I'm eight. Okay, good. Now, yeah. and, and older brains need that. Trust me, I can tell the difference now. Wow. And I used to, I was a crazy, I'm a, I'm a workaholic, but I'm like <laughs> in balance. I, I used to be a crazed workaholic. Like, like I would, you had to. Like I would get up at five in the morning. I would struggle to get home by 10 at night. And I and I sort of had three different medical careers going simultaneously. I was the, the psych hospital piece and the addiction program. I had an outpatient medical practice and an inpatient medical Jeez. practice. And it, it was very insane. But you said and you I, were I balanced or imbalanced? No, now I'm balanced. Then I was okay. total workaholic. Like, like I don't know how my wife stayed with so me. So what do you balance it out with now? I don't work so much. <laughs> right. And what do you do to, to make sure you're not working? Like, how do you spend your time when you're not working? Uh, hanging up with my wife, having my kids, working out. I mean, like after I have nothing planned after this today. We may go down. That's we may go down to Orange County. I mean, that's being able to. Well, have, this is a six-hour podcast. Oh well. <laughs> yeah, it's the but, double but, Joe Rogan. <laughs> the double Rogan. Yeah, we, we do the, the double Rogan. The old double Rogan. Yeah, but it, it's it's just different. Like I can I can come do something like this. I can have lunch with somebody. I I, I haven't had had lunch. I, I haven't had my, you know this this AM radio show that we talked about that got canceled. That's six hours a day handed back to me. I used to wow. drive to Culver wow. City every day. You know, that's where KBC was. Yeah, that's do, where my gym is. Do an hour wor of prep and then three hours of radio and then an hour no. wherever else I was going. So it was six hours just, gave, I got it Getting back. back it's crazy. You. Wow. So, speak, so never speaking had, of, had that since 1978. Of, uh, of sleep, I want to ask you something because I've <clears throat> talked to a lot of people about this, including doctors, and they have different, they say different things and I'm very confused. So mm. I started having this thing uh, like, I think actually when I got off of benzos, mm. where as I right as I would be falling asleep, you wake up feeling like you're having a fucking panic attack. Not yeah, it's not so much a panic attack. It's like a a like a <gasps> yeah. like a loss of breath, but it, yeah. it it's not like a panic attack where it lingers. It's yeah. just that one split second yeah. of. And I've spoke to a lot of people yeah. who have it, and doctors have given me different answers. What do they tell you? I've heard. Uh, it's been years, but like I remember somebody telling some guy was telling me like about how we used to be monkeys and sleep in trees, and nah. like you have this you, you, when when you would be a monkey and you would be falling off the tree, you would have to. No, and then no, other no, people no. say it's your body. A doctor said it's your body falling asleep before your brain, or the other way around. There's stuff like that that's happening that makes it, it's. He's right in the sense that that's the kind of sleep disturbance that is. But it's probably related to what you did with your brain with the and benzos in the pot. And so it's some residual kind of withdrawal, something. Because I've I spoken mean, to people who have it and they were never addicted to anything. Oh, it can happen also. I have it sometimes too. I still, right. I still have it. And and I, I associate it. When I go on long runs, I get that. So it's okay. – and, and I associate it strangely with dehydration. Mm, so if right. I'm a little dehydrated, I get that. I, I started that. taking ashwagandha yeah. before bed and it went away. But, but I'm but I, I I like where that one doctor was going with this being sort of a, a, a sleep disorder in the realm of hypnagogic hallucination and sleep terrors and those sorts of things where your your body and your brain are out of sync. And yeah. that makes sense to me given what you had done to yourself with the substances. And it, it's the amount of sleep disturbance from those two drugs, cannabis and and benzo, is pretty uncanny. It can go on for a few years. How, how long how long are you abstinent from both those? So I haven't drank in seven. Uh, Benzo. Benzos four. So this should be years stopping. Should or be something stopping. like that. You still have it? Well, it's weird. Like I'll go three months where it doesn't happen, and then one time it'll happen like four times in a night. And the other thing is. Sometimes if I think about it before I go to bed, it'll happen. happen. Yeah, you know, or when like I'll be laying in bed, like oh shit, I hope that thing that happens to me all the time doesn't happen. Look for look and at then, dehydration. I, I was I I had it. And I was shocked how much I drank a I, fucking okay. ton of water. But well, it could it water could be. is not a so much a hydrant. You have to put some solute in there, like some sodium and chloride. Okay, so drink you know something with some something in it. And see if that helps. Do you do you run a lot? Do you? Uh, I exercise a lot. Running not so much. Do, are you doing aerobic exercise? Where you I do. Okay. Yeah. And, and anaerobic, both that, weights, uh, yeah, right? Uh, anaerobic yeah. is weights. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, but the point is, you're you're exerting yourself heavily for long periods of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So absolutely. you can get dehydrated pretty easily. Okay, uh, that's what my for me it was associated with that. Okay, because I had the exact same thing. I think it's time we get to this one. I, th <laughs> I think. Come on, James. You gotta. You're. you're well, I have a very different story. So I've had MS for 18 years. Mm -hmm. For 15 of them, I kept it a secret. Huh. Mm. From. Not only just like the public, but like some of the closest people in my life. What, was that you not wanting to fully acknowledge it to yourself? I think it came from, yes, for sure. I also was raised 
to put out the perception that everything's perfect and right. lie when it's not. Right, right. I know that my mom was just doing the best she could and thought right. she was protecting me, right. but um, I was always uncomfortable with that, but followed it because I thought that was the best solution. So you have relapsing remitting? Not anymore because I've had it so long. It's primary progressive. Primary progressive. And are you on Capoxone or something? Or? No, I'm on something called Rituxin. Rituxin. It's like a chemotherapy yeah, twice yeah, a year. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's been stable for over eight years. It's great. Which is great. It's a big deal. Yes. Hey, thank God you live now. Yes, Because exactly. these, these treatments for MS really work. Yes, yeah. yes. And may and I ask I, what kind of deficits? The yeah, I'm. Uh, it initially started with bladder incontinence. Mm -hmm. Which, which is classic, right? Yes, which is like the, the common denominator. And then the, I have... Then I, is that lots of PP? It's, it's it, unable to hold your Yeah, bladder. so if you get in a hot bath, woo, forget it. Yeah, or swimming, uh, yeah. or sometimes I mean, a hot bath is a great place to have to be. <laughs> I never yeah. go to a hot tub with Jeremy somewhere. Yeah, let's go. But then the other classic is the eye. Nothing, everything is my waist down. So Good. it's my legs. Is so it only in your spinal column or is it in your brain? It's is maybe one lesion in my brain. The rest is all in my spinal column. That's, that's good. Um, I can't run, like Rob said. Um, I kind of have a limp when I walk. And because of keeping it a secret for so long and even at work, I was always using excuses and I hurt my back, this and that. And it was creating so much stress. I just retreated from everything, everyone. Mm. I ended up having a little boy and um, kind of redefined my life as a mom and was like, oh, I'm off the hook from this whole MS thing and having to tell anyone because I'm just going to hyper focus on being a mom. I had no help. I did it all on my own, exhausted myself completely. Ooh. And then when he was about two and a half, my husband and I were getting married and I felt like, what good am I doing for my son who's well aware of my limitations? As he gets older, I'm going to tell him to keep this a secret when I'm trying to teach him that the world is open for opportunities for everyone and everyone's deserving. So I decided to come forward, which was liberating and wonderful. But since then, that was about four years ago. I was always so heavily focused on the physical, the physical and fighting the physical and getting better. I didn't realize how much emotional damage it's done to me. And I think the last way anyone would describe me is an angry person, but I have so much anger inside of me. And I don't know how to process it. And I feel like sometimes I take it out on my children or like when I'm stressed, I, I try to be everything for everyone. And I am just signed up to try something next week called EMDR. Good. Mm -hmm. And EMDR um, is really good. Great. You might want to. Everyone I know that's done it has really? gotten yeah. pretty good. Yeah, benefits yeah. from. Because so it's a this way is of, about Jamie, Doctor Drew. It's a way of <laughs> it's a way of rewiring your brain around, wiring back into traumatized regions of the brain. Essentially, yeah. It's uh, stuff you were, this, when I was talking about you needing another person to rewire. Why is it coming back on me, Drew? Because yeah, I said it to you. No, it's what made me <laughs> think but, of it when you were yeah, telling but you that. The EMDR is yeah. another one of those interpersonal mechanisms that lets you wire stuff together. That yeah. and I have never allowed anyone to help me because I've just been just like fight through it, push through it, push through it. And because it was a secret, I was so used to doing it all on my own. And it's actually an issue with my husband and I because all he wants to do is help me. And sometimes I feel like I just want to be seen and heard and be like, I'm sorry, instead of trying to fix it or mm -hmm. who we should call. And um, I just feel like also too, I've noticed more and more with me, like when I get up and walk, I look at the floor because I just... I assume I make people uncomfortable when they have to watch how I have hmm. to move or I just don't, I don't want to be seen that way. I, 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 it's like maybe because I kept it a secret so long, I harbor all these feelings of like shame and guilt mm -hmm. around me and my worth and like, and my kids have helped me tremendously with that. I think because I'm like, you know, everything to them. I'm their queen, my two boys, and they make me feel like superwoman because I'm just exist, which has been so therapeutic for me. But there is deeper things that I know I need to deal with that has just been really, really hard. So, some trauma. Major that I, did, I would never assume. And you know, it's weird. It's like when I was younger, everything came easy to me. Mm. And it was almost like that thing where I would feel bad about it because, or guilty because if I tried something, I'd be good at it or I would get the leads in a play or I got Sopranos when I was 16 years old. Like life was just easy. And as soon as I got Sopranos, I 
developed an eating disorder. Mm. <clears throat> and then after that, it was just this. So then I was- Have you ever had that treated per se? Yes. Okay. And I feel like it's, it, okay. it was kind of, it wasn't so much about body and food. It was control. It's, like it's still the, it, it's for some people, if they have trauma, it becomes a regulatory mechanism. Yeah. Regulating emotions and things like that. Yeah. yeah. I, it's not so much with food. I guess I don't know what I do with it. But then all through my 20s, so then I had an eating disorder. Then I had diagnosed with Lyme disease. Good boy. Then I got diagnosed with MS. Then I got married. Then I got divorced. And this is all from 17 to 24. Yeah. All while I'm on the greatest show ever and everything should seem like it's all perfect and all of this that I'm going through is a secret. So it's like, and I never went to therapy during it, anything. So it was just like this whole 16 years of just a lot of trauma, I guess, that I never dealt with. And I, and it's manifested into like this terrible feeling that I carry with me that I hate because I approach the world every day and seeing the best in people and trying to be as kind and open and loving as I can be, but like to also have that feeling, it's just like this constant battle I have every day is, and is I don't it like it. Is it anger? I think so. I think so because you know, it's weird when I'm acting, it's my first choice. Anger. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. It's most kind of, accessible to you. Right, so yes. It's kind of common for codependence, which is what you're describing, right? Everything's for everybody else, for everybody else, for yeah. everybody else. And, and are you, do you experience yourself sort of through other people? Like, is it, is it hard for you to, to attune to your own emotional emotions, feelings as they come up? Um, other than anger. I think I'm aware. I think I have a good sense of like self-awareness of what I'm feeling. But I would much rather have the attention on somebody else. Right, yes. right. And and so your reg, your attention and focus on them is the priority. Yes. Yeah. And, okay. so, and if somebody else has a bad feeling, like you see somebody suffering, what happens? I, um, I want to help them. I want to fix them. I want to be there. I want to listen. Right, right, but then right. I like, then I start feeling guilty. Like why could why should I ever complain about my life? Okay. So so. You know, the need to fix the other person's feeling is really because you're very empathic and you you appreciate the feelings, but then you co-mingle your feelings with whomever this person is we're talking about. And you need to make it stop in that other person because it's actually mobilizing your pain. Mm. And so you, you when you're really codependent, you have trouble distinguishing somebody else's pain from your own because you are out there focused on them and you see it and you feel it. But it, it goes and mobilizes all your stuff. Yeah. That's why you have to make it stop. The other person, you didn't you didn't ask them if they need help or if they you want they want you to make it stop or anything. In codependence, like you, like me, we just go do it. We yeah. just, we'd have to make it better. Yeah. It's actually our feelings we're responding to. It's so interesting because I would have never described myself as codependent because I feel like I'm like I've always especially since my divorce, like and I'm very happily married now, just feel like I don't need anyone. Like I love my husband, but I don't feel like I need him. Yeah, needing people is different than okay. how you experience other people's emotions and you know and and, and our own. You know, it's just sort of a and I, I think being could have been a kind of a, a nice thing. It, it helps you really pay attention to the people's feelings. We're really good at it. Yeah. But the problem is we are not good with boundaries. Got so, it. Hmm. So do you think EMDR will be good for me? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm She's, just wondering what you're going to do with that anger. I just don't know what to do with that. I don't know. I mean, I, I think that I think that there's, <clears throat> I tend to blame everything on MS because it's such a big thing. But I also. MS I, patients aren't normally angry. Interesting. I feel like I don't know who I am without MS. Do you ever heard of La Belle Indifference? Uh-uh. Really? It's something that MS patients have. When you've seen MS patients that have really sort of advanced diseases, what were they like when you interacted with them? What were they like? Mm -hmm. Not not way advanced, but I mean like moderately advanced. Like, like they seem so much more accepting and happier than right. I am. That, well, and I'm okay. much more mobile okay. and okay. Can I just say that's how she seems to everyone. That she's indifferent to it, yeah, or that you're like she seems like the most together, the most responsible, yeah, yeah. the mo like she, uh, you know, we're like family, so it's like I I know things and she tells me things, but like from the outside and yeah. even like you know when I was in my addiction and not concerned about anybody else, like I just it was like Jamie is 
Yeah. You know. So, so la belle indifference is a feature. And that's Chinese? It's Chinese for, <laughs> for, for indifference, a beautiful indifference, uh, indifference to your disease state. And so you can see MS patients mm -hmm. dragging the right side of their body like, like completely like, eh, how's it going today? What's going on? They seem very happy. And that's one of the gifts of MS is yeah. that it doesn't bother people with it so much. What's interesting is I'm wondering because yours is most in your spine, you don't get whatever that is that triggers uh, the indifference. Maybe. I wish I had that in a way. Like <laughs> I wish I could just own it, mm -hmm. you know, but it's like I'm still, I think I'm still understanding and grasping the fact that people know and it's okay. Um, I'm still learning how to ask for help. Um, and I'm aware of all of that. I just... I just wish I could have more love for myself. Like I wish I could, I guess, see uh, see myself if, the way other people tell me they see me. If if you get that trauma stuff integrated right, I bet yeah. I bet some of the stuff will drop away. I hope so. Yeah, yeah. yeah cool. She's also she was experimenting with ayahuasca. I know you had somebody on your podcast it, talking yeah, about with it. ayahuasca for trauma therapy. I'm going to do it. With do you have a good? Mm -hmm. Because what's your experience with that? Uh, it's all I can't recommend it yet because we just yeah. don't have the data. I, 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 low dose ketamine and MDMA look safer to me. Yeah, well, that's, that's what, what I'm. Happened. That's what I'm talking about, yeah. baby. High, high dose ketamine yeah. or low dose? No, I, I used <laughs> to, uh, the last time I drank, I took 35 Molly. Oh, this was no, I, I, seven I, years. I have had I'm joking addicts, around with with the. Fact I've that. had addicts who, with recalcitrant depression, go on ketamine therapy, have a good response on their mood, and have a relapse. Not yeah, a bad yeah. one, but yeah. it makes me worry sure. about ketamine. I used to do a right. lot of K. Yeah, with Molly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and MDMA again, how you dose it and what hands sure. you should be in and stuff. I, I just worry about who's doing it and how they're doing it and that kind of stuff. It's a highly, highly vetted, vetted people. I trust would trust my children's lives with have told me about this person and have done multiple journeys no i know there's them. a lot of them out there isn't i know i this know is exactly what i was saying i was saying the same shit drew because you went to you've had you've gone to see three different times and they all ended up really because you went to one and it was like, i did one i did well, do they a got journey their four stuck in the car years door. ago <laughs> and two people got in like a heavy physical altercation jesus but it was the it. shaman and the shaman's Boy, boyfriend boyfriend oh so yeah. i was basically left oh on another gosh. planet for five hours on the floor with nobody to talk me oh through it <laughs> and she can't wait to do it again. <laughs> and I, we, I imagine we have no idea what it does to the ms um or the relationship with the rituxan well i i i've they're well aware of medicine and 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 that and i've i've Brought in every my whole team of people. You've told like, them what you're going to do, mm -hmm. the, the neurologist. Mm -hmm. I, I again, I I don't object. It's mixed to, with mushrooms. Her version. By okay. The way. Well, so that's yeah, the yeah, other yeah. thing is that there's these. Everyone has these differing ideas about the plants and right. how much plant, how much this, how much that. Should it be MDMA, ketamine? Should it be mushrooms? Blah blah blah. Um, there's this is what bothers. There's lots of different ideas out there. I I on my uh, two weeks ago on my streaming show, I did an interview to a psychiatrist who does very well trained psychiatrist. I, and she uses low-dose MDMA, low-dose ketamine. And I was thoroughly convinced that if she wanted to do something, if you wanted to go see her, I'd sign off on it. Yeah. Because she knew exactly what well, she we'll was doing. we'll get her name. Okay. I don't yeah. remember it right now. No, we'll go to your website. Is that like, micro, it's microdosing? It's not really microdosing, no. It's, it's, it's just oh, like one on specific. It's, it's it, again, she adjusts, I'm sure, to your particular needs based on what her clinical impression is. I see. Uh, but she's not. the main thing she's not using is the high-dose ketamine associated with treatment of depression. She's using a low dose for trauma therapy. Got it. Yeah. But would you think I'd have depression too? Again, with MS, depression is not very common, right? That's because they all have that kind of indifference. Uh, I, I, I don't experience you as a depressed person sitting here, but somebody needs to go through a little inventory. Right, right, right. But Jamie, the, the last time, and we could edit this out if you don't want to leave this in, but the, the last time I went to your house, you said like you just sat on the couch crying all morning and you didn't know why. Mm-hmm. But is that mm -hmm. just because you were overwhelmed by having two kids? It's not uncommon dealing with I two think kids. I just, yeah, I think sometimes I think life catches up with me. I'm just go, go, go because I will stretch myself so thin to be the best um, podcaster, best actress, best wife, best mother. Uh, so and I And I come last. Very perfectionist. 
which is why I don't like that I can't move normally because mm-hmm. I want to move perfect. And then if somebody said that, to me, what is Jamie like? I'd be like, she's perfect. You know, <laughs> so she pulls it off. Yeah. But yeah. She, she shouldn't. Ha- is the, but you would say she's perfect even if she didn't work at it, though. Of course. Even mm-hmm. if she. Yeah. She's just, you know, I don't she's, have many friends in my life for 22 years, mm-hmm. however long. And it's, you know, I'm always watching her to wait for her to slip up. Like I'm waiting to see her do something fucked up because in 22 years, I've never seen her do anything that's other than, you know, perfect. perfect. Yeah. I, I had I had a lot of perfectionists at one point in my life and I found delegating helped me get over that. Letting other people do stuff. That was my yeah. solution. Personally. Yeah, let me and Cass be the perfect podcasters. <laughs> per, 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 <laughs> <personally laughs> help me get out of that. I'm just saying. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Because yeah. I had to be the per, I had to be the one on the spot doing perfect. Yes. And if I let somebody else do it, scared me. Uh, and I felt guilty. Yeah. But it helped me reduce the perfection. My first step with that was allowing like my nanny to put my son to there bed. You go. I used to like be like, nope, I can't meet you till after bedtime because I had to be the one to there do it. And so allowing her to do that kind of stuff has definitely been your, your, like a your first face step. brightens when you just talk about that even. Mm, mm. Interesting. Mm. Cool. Well, I guess I'm taking baby stuff. It's, it's all you can do, really. Yeah. You can't, you, you jump in too fast, it doesn't work. Right. You just get over, you get, you fall back. Yeah. There's something, when you were just talking about you don't experience her as a depressive person. Yeah. There's something that's come up a, a few times from, from all the hours of Loveline that you've done where you've essentially listened to, I don't know how many tens of thousands, either. maybe a hundred thousand, yeah. but you were able to hear somebody for the first five seconds. Yeah. And just pinpoint whether that person, I mean, most of the time you were right. I, yeah. I didn't experience a time when you were wrong, but I right. don't want to say you're right every time. I you was could right. tell they were molested. Yeah. You could tell if they were depressed. You could tell yeah. if they were on drugs. Yeah. Is Does that count for anything now? Like, well, that, you, was, that was me listening with my whole body. That's what we talked about at the very beginning. I feel like I so, became an expert in, in because then, you know, just maybe a few years ago, I went and listened to the entire back catalog that, oh, you know, so it's I'm just because so it was super fun to me. No, it's fun. <laughs> it's, it's an experiment yeah. and you get to hear the qualities in somebody's voice and then you get to associate them with certain disorders yeah, and things. And, yeah. and it, I was so it, fascinated it, it, with that. So, so as I was describing to you at the very beginning, so first you hear something yeah. and that sort of tells you, mm, it alerts you to something's up and you meet, and you cognitively go, okay, what are those things? You sort of get a list. And then I go, would go, well, what am I feeling? Mm-hmm. Well, how do they make me feel? Yeah. Uh, and, and, ha- and if I close my eyes, what am I seeing when I hear that voice? Is there something I see? Right. And that's it. The when, that would, that so would inform wow. me. He would hear a girl, and a lot of times if their voice was high. Not high. It's a certain quality. It's a, it's a quality, but they had like a childish Childlike, yeah. quality Childlike. to their voice. He'd be like, were you molested? They'd be like, well, the first they'd say like, no, nah, I don't know. And then you'd be like, were you molested? Well... I mean, my uncle yeah. did some weird stuff. Were you molested? Yeah, they well, raped no, me. Normally, like it took no, normally a... <laughs> I'd have to go, I'd have to, I'd have to, then I would have to do the mind read stuff. Yeah. I, I'd have to go, I'd have to close my eyes and go, what, something about your uncle. I, it just would occur to me. It's and so I, weird. I don't know where that yeah, would come yeah. from. And, yeah. and that's weird when that would happen. And yeah. they, 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 that would then break through their denial because yeah. they, they could no longer. Or what was even weirder to me is they would, they would start talking about it from the frame of where they were at that moment. It's like mm. like, it, like it was just happening. Yeah. And I was there with them. Very weird, very interesting kind of stuff. I, and that's trauma, right? Trauma is ar- pieces of our brain just stuck, arrested, and walled off from the rest of us. And then they it needs attention. It calls out all the time. The person isn't aware of it, but if you're attuned to that stuff, you feel it, hear it, see yeah. it. Yeah. Kind of Who else has that experience with... Let's just say you spoke to a hundred thousand. I think I was unique. Who? Adam Carolla. Has that Carolla has a ton for yeah. sure. He's but pretty, with the medical background, you have to be. Yeah, that's weird. You right? have to just be able to just talk to anyone, and you know, with with a certain degree of confidence within. I don't know, a fucking ninety percent, just be like, well, this is probably how what happened to you. Sounds like you were maybe abused as a kid. Or but I have mm. to turn that all on. You know, I have to sit and. Yeah, literally close my eyes and listen to that. I I I, so. I think it's great, and 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 your wife who's into kind of like uh psych. She's, she's into, into psychic, psychic stuff. stuff. Yeah, she oh, is. I want to ask. Oh, you, you. got to come on her show. Okay, Please. she would die to have you. Wait, on the show. She's big she's, into that. She's big into touch. that stuff. I'm all about okay, it. Okay, oh, so my. here's two. She's two way into it. 
How how much of that do you buy into? Okay. And he then, is psychic. What do you mean he can close well, his eyes and think about so, it? So, but how much of that is experience versus <laughs> yeah. how much so, is that? So here's what I so I watch them because my wife all her friends are psychic stuff. So I watch yeah. them very carefully. Yeah, and because uh, I uh, and I and I actually wired up Tyler Henry. I don't know if you saw that. I wired up for EEGs and stuff. And I do remember that. Yeah, happening. and so yeah. we because because what I noticed was there. They're not talking to dead people, and my wife hates that. I, I don't believe they're talking to dead sure. people. I don't believe they're talking to dead people. I believe they're cold but, reading, but but they're doing something, right? Something's happening. And one maybe. thing I noticed early on is they have neurologically unusual eye movements while they're thinking about or talking about these readings or whatever. And some of it's a rotatory nystagmus where their eyes go like this. That's unheard of in a conscious person. Okay. And and they will typically start looking up into this sort of toward right frontal cortex, which is, again, sort of holistic parts of the brain. Mm. And uh, so I figured they they were doing something. Uh, and and it's something similar to what I do when I'm listening to the- That's the connection yeah. I want to make. It's yeah. like, do you possess this? Well, I think it's similar. That's because yeah. I I think some of the things that happen to me are uncanny. I can't explain sure. it. I just explain it as some sort of exchange. We, there's all kinds of exchange going on between our bodies that we're just not aware of. Yeah, there's a lot but, of energy. Yeah, I mean, our, our cerebral me, cortex. Me there's cere a lot going especially on. Especially us. Yeah. It's very <laughs> heavy. Yeah. Sadie's going to blow it's a heavy weight. It's <laughs> false chef. He will, I, too. Yeah, I see it. <laughs> and the, uh, Floss with your pubes. And, and the- uh, oh Wow. Now, now it's gross. All right. Uh, he always goes there. I always go there. But, but uh, where was I? Th that there's so much that we, you know, we have this evolved instrument for very specific purposes. And one of it is not seeing what's going on on a bodily base exchange level, which is our right brain, which is giving us holistic information that we can get from each other if we learn how to listen to it. I think these people are doing something like that. I believe here's my here's my philosophy, here's my here's my woo woo piece of it. Though. Yeah, okay. So I believe that consciousness is a co created phenomenon. Mm -hmm. I, I think all the rhetoric about the hard problem of consciousness, it's true if you're looking at a single skull. But as soon as you realize that the reason we develop consciousness is because we see ourselves reflected in other people mm -hmm. and we are constantly exchanging your view of me yeah. it's your it's that's how i experience myself and you know you and i we do it more more because we're codependent but it's 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 that literally able to observe ourselves from an observer that you're giving me yeah and that's where consciousness comes from yeah is that second order frame and so it seems rational to me that we all kind of leave probably parts of ourselves behind on each other in some weird way. Mm. Totally. And if you're some really important relationship, like parent, there's probably all kinds of stuff left yeah. in me that if somebody's super attuned, they can kind of pull it out. Yeah. Wow. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. And I don't even yeah. think that's that woo-woo. I think it, it, I think it, it, it's just something we don't understand and can measure yeah, that's quite right. properly. And so I wired up Tyler Henry and lo and behold, his brain was doing crazy stuff during a reading. He was reading Steve-O. I brought Steve-O and was a total skeptic and he nailed him in terms of his mom and how she died and stuff. And he was... He his, his EEG showed him to be asleep with uh, asleep with these these crazy spikes of uh, sort of Whoa. extreme. So does that mean he's in some sort of trance when that's I, happening? It's not a normal state, whatever it is. Wow. I had a and reading so, with Tyler Henry and the, sh the shit he said about my brother who passed away was mm -hmm. bananas. No way. Anyone. He didn't even know I who I come was. Around. I could come around on this stuff. Yeah, he's got some science to prove it, and, and that's what I something. mean. This is it, so cool. It's worth taking. Do you it buy into the Joe Dispenza? Do uh, you know who Joe Dispenza no. is? Oh, okay. Mind Not body, re really? like Tell where we could heal ourselves with our mind. Yeah, uh, and and he has a he has, uh, but he, he does the wiring up. Yeah, I hear you. Doesn't that, that make you angry? Because <laughs> you would I kill mean, yourself if it, you could. Yes, <laughs> it makes me feel like yeah. I just don't know how to do right. it. Right? No. Mm -mm. Mm, interesting. So to me, it's unfair. People are sick. Wait till he gets sick. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that we do need Western medicine for it's, it's, a lot. Look, of it, people don't realize there there's libraries filled with all the shit that can happen to us. Yeah, it's extraordinary what can go right. down in, in our biological system. It's amazing we're all sitting here and with just limited problems that we have. It's amazing. Well, it must fr frustrate you with the whole anti-vax flat Earth movement where people have literally just taken to schooling themselves by Google and your Dunning Kruger. Everybody, career, yeah. Dunning Kruger is alive and well. Yeah, the Dunning Kruger effect. Look it up. Everybody is suffering from it today. Yeah. It, and it's the Google phenomenon, I think, that's done it. Mm. You get a real doctor and it's worth nothing. This is <laughs> I know. With, my peers have started putting a thing on the wall that says, do not confuse your Google search with my medical training. Yeah, true. Wow. And that's a good one. So. Uh, see, you know what's funny? I know that that 
really like doctors are so sick of it because I'm the guy who like, I never go to the doctor. I never say I have anything wrong. And like, I hadn't gone to my doctor in like two years and I went and I don't even remember what it was. I think there was just like a mole on my back or like there was something where I was like, oh, this is what's wrong. And he didn't even want to hear it. Like he was just so like, <laughs> you're fine. Take, and I'm like, so, I haven't seen you in two years. I have one thing wrong and you won't even let me finish saying what I'm saying so, because So, so here, here's the thing. The, what you look up on Google is what we knew at the end of second year medical school. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then but I didn't spend, even I didn't even tie, spend the diagnose next myself. eight to ten years seeing that in a clinical setting and lear and learning judgment, yeah. developing judgment about those conditions. And so we we can smell it. We can we know it. We walk in the room. We just know it immediately. And we've had hundreds of times we've seen it. Can know if it's really a problem or it's not, or mm -hmm. what we ought to do with it, or when it needs more consultation. We just we just have judgment. You go to the doctor for judgment. That's it. For or or something technical like a surgical procedure that only he or she can do. That's it. That's why you go. Well, you're the man, Drew. Uh, right. Can we just keep it's, it's six hours up already? Yeah, I'm, right. I, I, I had I had one story I wanted to tell you oh, before. Please, please. Before, okay. So I, I realized two days ago I've never told this story to anybody. Oh except hell for, yeah! Except for the day after it happened, I shared it with two of my friends, and then it just kind of like. Left probably, you know, I'm sure you could tell me why. But um, so I meet this girl out, right? And we're dating kind of like, you know, and, and we're f fooling around. And I'd say, Ooh. you got to go. Why is that on? Uh oh, Weird. okay. I'd say some psychic shit. I'd say like uh, three, three months maybe. And we're dating and things, we're having a good time. Everything's fine. But we never had sex. And I was... uh. 18 so i wasn't like really thinking it was a big deal but we did everything else and it was like super like raunchy we're always naked but she wouldn't have sex with me so I'm, whatever i don't i don't care i wasn't even trying like i was having a great time whatever and one day she's like uh i need to talk to you and we're i remember we're naked in her bed and she's like i want to have sex with you uh right now and i'm falling for you but there's something i have to tell you and i said okay and she said, uh, somebody- Let me I just was, say, what, what, to a young male, whatever comes out of her mouth next does not matter. Right. <laughs> right. There's, yeah. a, I, there's a dragon in my vagina. Yeah. He's like, I'll deal with it. Don't well, worry let about me it. tell you something. <laughs> I got up and left. So, oh, it's yeah. going to be harsh. There's so a dragon she, said, in for her now. she said, uh, somebody hired me to date you. Oh, Jesus. I never told Jamie this. Wow. Wait, this is the plot of a movie. Yeah. But guess what? I really did what? fall in love with this you. This is exactly what happened. So what? she goes, <laughs> so I don't want to say the media outlet, but a certain media <gasps> outlet Russian paid this farm. girl oh my God. to infiltrate my f circle of friends, wow. get in, and she... She really, uh, you know, I think she was a girl who like was living in New York, just got out of college, needed money, so she got this opportunity. Wow. Did I meet her? Or whatever. No, you never met her. That's incredible. I don't think, or maybe you did one. Yeah, and she, um, yeah, and it's just all she was telling me this, and I remember like I was in a really bad car accident, and I remember it was that same feel, that silence. You know that silence yes. you hear about when like the car is flipping over, and you're just like, yeah. yeah I remember yeah. her saying that, and it was just like, whew. yeah, like, yeah. And I was like. Oh, because you're you're going through every fucking little, and then you're like, oh my god, that article came out about me and my friends being in that fucking club, and how we got, and things we did when we were inside, and how would people know? And that, and she was fucking, she, and she's like, after the first uh, or like second article that they did, I I told them I couldn't do it anymore because I started falling for you, and she was like, that was uh, a, and she said it was literally like a movie where they she was like i can't do it and they were like you can't and they were like how about if we pay you and they like slid her the thing and she said it was like a ridiculous amount of money for her but she's like i was falling for you and i, I want i would argue that you need to i'm not gonna tell you what to do but that whoever that media outlet it needs to be outed they need, they need, they need, no they need, wonder you they, don't they, trust they, women. They, I know. I know. It's 18 when all this oh shit's going God. down, too. Yeah. That's but, crazy, But I dude. think that, that company needs to be taken to task, man. That is really heavy that stuff. That is so That company, wow. HLM. No. It was <laughs> HBO. <laughs> no, but the, yeah. And I and you know what's funny? I totally blocked it out for so long. I and I just uh, remembered it like a couple days ago where I was like, holy shit, that. I can't believe oh, that. And it was for phenomenal. months. And it was like going and like, you know, we were. Oh. It was, and by the way, I did not have sex with her. I got up. I was like, "You are a fucking piece of shit." Like I, and I really like. I was, I was just so like, yeah, it was fucked up. I am so sorry. What a violation! I, after just having been violated by your best buddy, I think that happened after. I think that might have been like nineteen or whatever, because I stopped dating the girl, and I found out like a year later that all that shit was going on. But still, it's like one two punch. Yeah, man. Was, yeah, and how it was just trust anybody. Yeah, and then Except I just. Jeff. 
yeah, perfect Jamie. person. Jamie, I mean, and then I start, and that's when I really, I think it was like that, that, and all of a sudden, where I just started like. I would not see my friends for like three days or whatever. And then I would go see them and they'd be like, dude, we haven't seen you in two weeks. And I'd be like, oh, cause I'd be just taking Percocets on my couch. And like, not that I would black out or anything, but just a day became two days and three. And all of a sudden I would like stay up for 30 hours, sleep for 16. Like, and it just became this thing. And then all of a sudden it would be like, Hey, it's blah, blah, blah's birthday tonight. And I'd be like, okay, like I'll come out and drinking because I, I really stopped enjoying drinking a long time ago. Like, who takes care of you other than you? Uh, Jamie did push. She had kids. Now I'm fucked. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, no, me. Yeah, only me. I feel like you need people that actually care about you. Well, I have people who care about me, but I don't that, let anyone that, take care of me. But I feel like that would not be a bad thing. Yeah. No, I have a ton of people who care about me, then, checking then up them, on this, but like them, really letting them in and taking care of me, I let, don't. Let them take care of you a little bit. A little bit. Not everything. A little bit. Yeah. Uh, so good for you to be here telling this. I've been trying to take care of this guy for a long time. Anyone oh, please. You? you know when those fucking fires happen, those Getty <laughs> fires and shit? I was one block away from evacuation zone. I had just moved here. He doesn't even call me. I he texted you. Jamie, because Jamie's perfect. Of course she well, does. I'm not perfect. <laughs> this not fucking perfect. asshole. I, like, the, I did the, like, I did oh, the I bed the in the guest room. Come over. Uh, yeah, I checked she's where like, the fire lines say. were, Drew. Uh, I saw that he was safe. Yeah, I'm sure. This guy's... Fuck this guy. Uh, <laughs> look, it's been a real honor having you yes. here. It's been a privilege. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Fun. Where should we go? DrDrew.com? Yeah, that's it. Just and and all that stuff Twitter. Robert Paul Champagne said about you, it's bullshit. You're yeah, handsome. I, I feel terrible for RPC. I, I know. Really do. Oh, I, is this I, a cool I, I, guy? Yeah, yeah, I reviewed yeah. that with uh, Christina P. last night. She's on a pod. That's oh, gonna be she's up my soon. favorite. She's the best. Oh. And, and, uh, and, I, and I told her, I said, do you remember when you first showed me his video? I felt terrible for him. Yeah. And now I feel like extra terrible like we've heard him or something i don't i, I we love him with 2395 right? he's an That's interesting right. guy yeah and uh we'll try we're gonna try to heal that all up and oh i love it's the most he's it's the most the, interesting man in the world it really is it's I, the Tom most and intriguing I want to take him out to dinner in like a fine restaurant and see how that goes yeah all of it all those people so jamie we're talking about another podcast who has uh, these dr like, drew after dark yeah, well yeah. dr drew after dark is but his thing on your mom's house, house. Oh, yeah your mom. and it's just it's my favorite out yeah. there like they're probably the reason why I, I wanted to start this where no I just kidding. like because I just love like they look like they're having the best fucking time ever they, you know it, yeah it and my dad fun. looks exactly like Tom Segura <laughs> so there, there's some weird shit there too for sure like I'll show you a picture when we're done with That's this crazy. It's, it's creepy wow. how much he looks like him well it's been a pleasure sir thank you thank, thank you, you so I much, stay here all day so much. And, uh, I'll, I'll get out of here now but thank you for having me appreciate no, it please thank come you. back too we've done and done thank you so much the corner for me awesome oh great